Hey everybody, good to see you today. I am doing a pri uh, impromptu live. So I just was typing up a word and I thought, oh, I'd rather speak it. So here I am. So I'm gonna just get into it. I know that people will be coming on live, but people watch it back later. So I'm just gonna get into the word that I wanna share with you today because I've had some things that are just running over in my heart and, and I thought, oh, when it, when it comes like a flood, I know I've got to share it. You know, I ponder a lot all the time, sitting on stuff. But when it comes, it just flooded my heart, all the things that I have been talking to God about in these last few weeks and months. And so I just want to share with you what I feel like Holy Spirit actually wants me to share with you today. Uh, so say, oh, hi, Michelle. So say a hello. I can see some comments today, but I'm just going to get into it because I don't, you know me, I'm long-winded. I don't want to take too much of your time, but I just want to, look, there's just been some things on my heart that I just want to get out there and clarify a bit about what I'm seeing happening in the body of Christ at the moment and where I feel that we're going and where we are. And, and so I just, um, just give me some time this morning just to share my heart, really. That's what I want to do. I just want to share my heart and uh, especially about the spirit of Elijah and how that works in the in the times and the seasons of God. And hello, we've got people from America. Hello, everyone. So, okay, I just want to share a few dreams and I want to share today a few intercession encounters that our team has had. And so in those um, intercession encounters, a lot of time, you know, we know that prophecy comes through intercession well you know in assessors of prophets not uh you know uh, sorry not I, I love what cindy jacobs says that not all prophets are in, uh, not all intercessors are prophets but all prophets are intercessors and so a lot of uh things that happen in intercession is definitely you know the prophetic word of the lord and so i'm just going to quickly get into right now uh, what I just want to share with you. So I had this dream and I've shared this on another video of mine, but I want to talk more into this today. I had this dream on the 29th of March this year. And in the dream, it was just a very abstract dream. It was uh, just a square. I saw this square platform and I saw Elizabeth, which is John the Baptist's mum standing there. That was it. That was the dream. I woke up after seeking the Lord about the, the dream and saying, okay, why do I see Elizabeth of all people? I felt the Lord tell me to go and look up the name of what Elizabeth means. And it means oath. It means covenant. And it means um, oath, covenant, and vow. Okay, important. Vow, oath, and covenant. And I felt like the, the Lord said, there is a company of John the Baptists being birthed in the earth right now. Now, you know, we've heard a lot about the spirit of Elijah. We've heard a lot about, uh, you know, John the Baptist coming forth. I know I've been carrying that word for the longest time. But in this dream, it was not John the Baptist I saw, it was Elizabeth. And God was showing me that through seeing what she gave birth to, Elizabeth gave birth to John the Baptist, and, and her name meaning covenant and oath, God was saying to me that there are a people, there is a company of John the Baptist that God has prepared in the wilderness, that he is going to be birthing in the earth right now that carry the spirit of Elijah. And the scriptures say, you know, in the gospels that John was he, Jesus even said, who carried the spirit of Elijah uh, to prepare the way of the Lord, Isaiah 40, Malachi 4, uh, and so Luke 1, 17 or Luke 1 uh, talks about that. And so in my dream, it was, but, but it was Elizabeth giving birth to the John the Baptist. But what that meant was that these John the Baptist, these, these company of Elijah prophets uh, are going to call God's people to oath. They're calling God's people to, to covenant again. And I've shared that in another uh, you know, message I did about a governmental authority and rule and reign. That's not sort of where I want to go today, but I want to talk more about the spirit of Elijah and how we can, there, there, there can be some conflict of doctrine. There can be some conflict of belief system in uh, the prophetic circles and in understanding the spirit of Elijah. And when the spirit of Elijah hasn't really been prominent, which I don't believe, it has. To be honest, I don't believe there's been a strong spirit of Elijah that's been, you know, there's been a company that have been very minute, but God is causing the voice of the spirit of Elijah now to accelerate, to amplify, and he's going to give a sound to, the, to those Elijah prophets. 
Now, when that has not been uh, in a time of Elijah, a uh, spirit of Elijah, where we understand the spirit of Elijah comes in to prepare the way of the Lord. That's what the spirit of Elijah comes to do. It comes to prepare the God's people's heart and call them back into the heart of God. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time speaking about it, teaching in the spirit of Elijah. You can get my book, The Avenger. I speak I spend a couple of chapters on the spirit of Elijah teaching about the preparation of the Lord. But I am going to talk a couple of uh, verses here today in Luke 1, 15 to 17. Now, uh, the, the, the angel is talking to Zechariah which is John's father, and he's, and he's prophesying who he will be, John the Baptist. Luke 1, 15 to 17, for he will be great and distinguished in the sight of the Lord. And he must drink no wine nor strong drink, and he will be filled with and controlled by the Holy Spirit, even in and from his mother's womb. And he will be, and he will turn back, and cause to return many of the sons of Israel. Now, does this say many of the sons of the world? No, it says the sons of Israel. And we see here that the spirit of Elijah are prophets called to the church. Okay, I'm going to say that there are prophets called to the church to turn back the hearts of strayed of the strayed, the hearts of the lukewarm, the hearts of those that have uh, not are not in in deep intimacy with the Lord. He says, I'm going to turn back many to the sons of Israel to the Lord, their God, and he will himself go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn back the hearts of the fathers to the children. And I love the Amplified in Luke 1, 17, the in disobedient, incredulous, unpersuadable. Come on, come on. Disobedient, incredulous, unpersuadable to the wisdom of the upright, which is the knowledge and holy love of the will of God. So the spirit of Elijah goes forth to return people back to loving God's will. It turns the hard hearts and causes them to be uh, soft again. It causes them to come back from seeking their own ways and their own paths and tagging God's name on it or even not tagging God's name on it, whether they're, they're lukewarm or they're not even lukewarm, where they're, where they're totally strayed. But God says that the spirit of Elijah turns back the hearts to love the will of God. Come on. In order, why? Why is this important? In order to make ready for the Lord a people prepared in spirit, adjusted and disposed and placed in their right moral state. Now, Jesus said in Matthew 3, we had a conversation in our family devotions about this a few months ago, which ended into a Holy Ghost blowout in our family. It was beautiful. But um, we had this conversation with the kids explaining to them what it meant when Jesus said, John comes, when John said, I come that I might baptize you in water, but he who comes after me baptizes you in the Holy Spirit and fire. So the the, the message of, of the Elijah prophets is to prepare the heart for the baptism of fire. Now we see here, Elijah was um, the prophet that came to Israel in the time of the rule of Jezebel. And there was such great idolatry and, and ob obscene perversity. Okay, so he comes and, and Ahab, the husband, which is a king of Israel, says to Elijah, who are you who troubles Israel? Now, the thing is, when Elijah's haven't been on the scene for a while, the church seemed to think that they're troublers of the church. In actual fact, they're ones that want to reveal the heart of God back to his people so that when they're in a confused state, see, Israel were, were in a confused state in the times of um, Baal, of Jezebel and Ahab's rule. And, and God wanted to turn their hearts back. They were confused and, you know, Elijah shows up and says, you know, who are you going to serve anymore? If you're going to serve Baal, serve him. If God is Baal, serve him. If God is God, serve him. You can't serve two masters. And so we see that Elijah had to restore the altar. And we see in Isaiah 40 about the messenger that God prepares and sends before, prepares the heart, every valley, every mountain, every crooked place, every rough place. This is the heart. Now I'm giving you a very quick overview. And so this is the heart that needs to be prepared. And we see that Elijah rebuilds the altar. He pours the water over the altar. Now we see clearly this is the baptism of John. This is the baptism of repentance that comes before the, the baptism of fire. Now, in a, if, we, if we're going to see this in, a, in a, a prophetic sense, you know, if God used the spirit of Elijah to come, 
and to prepare the way before the first coming of Messiah, then don't you think that the spirit of Elijah is going to come and prepare the God's people for the second coming of Messiah? He came first as the lamb, he's come in second as the lion. And the, the Lord is sets a precedent. You know, when the disciples said to Jesus, you know, in Matthew 17, it says the disciples asked him, then why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He replied, Elijah does come and he will get everything restored and ready. But I tell you that Elijah has come already. Now, Jesus is telling his disciples this and they did not know or recognize him. Now, the scribes are teaching that the spirit of Elijah must come first, but John had already come and they didn't recognize him. This is what I'm saying. When the spirit of Elijah comes, the church may know that he's coming, but they don't recognize what this spirit of Elijah is doing in these prophets. Now, not all prophets are prophets of Elijah, I believe. Not all prophets carry the mantle of Elijah. They don't carry that uh, that that mantle of the spirit of Elijah. We even see di there were different prophets in the Old Testament that had different functions. Daniel had a different function. There were different functions. But God chose the Elijah anointing as an anointing because, you know, I thought to myself, why didn't he say the spirit of Jonah or the spirit of, you know, Habakkuk or the spirit of, you know, Isaiah, he didn't use any other prophet but Elijah because Elijah was one that called the church back to prepare them for the, and that symbolic thing of the baptism of fire. Now, we could have, there's a long sermon in all of that and, and we're not going to go there today because I just really want to fit, I really want to pull out a few uh, distinct things today. Now, we see here, so John the Baptist says, you know, I come before I baptize you in water. He who comes after me baptizes in the Holy Spirit and fire. We know that was Acts chapter two. The baptism of fire came on the early church. Why? So that they could be bold witnesses in the earth. Now we stand in another place in time. I believe that the spirit of Elijah is coming in the earth right now and it is preparing the way of the Lord. He is making every mountain low, every crooked place straight, every rough place smooth and he and valley lifted. Now that is in the hearts of God's people. Now in my book, I explain the Avenger. I explain that process of that landscape change of Isaiah 40. I explain that. So I don't want to take time into that, but you can go read that in my book and you will understand what that looks like in your personal life further. But let's talk corporately, right? So corporately, the spirit of Elijah comes to prepare the hearts of his people and they will speak to the church and call them back to the heart of God. Now, what troubles me and what I've seen is when things have gone out of balance in the past, the church loved to make doctrines around error. So if someone, for instance, goes into an extreme doctrine, the church want to balance that extreme doctrine. They throw the baby out with the bathwater and now all of a sudden they, they are against completely anything that... Uh, so I'll, I'll give you an example. For instance, we see in, in, in the past, we've seen you know what we call doom, gloom, judgment type prophets that are just harsh, there's no love. They don't come with a spirit of uh, mercy. They don't come with a spirit of, because uh, we know mercy brings people to repentance, don't we? So they, they don't come with mercy and truth. They might speak some truth, but they've got this harsh uh, vein. We've seen that in the body, right? So then what happens is we say, okay, that's not really the heart of God. The prophetic's been a bit misconstrued. The prophetic be has been misrepresented. So we make a doctrine and we say anyone that calls anyone to repentance or consecration or holiness is a doom gloom prophet, right? Now I'm talking extremes, but I've seen these extremes around. Now what that does is that totally wipes out all legitimacy of an Elijah prophet. And I've seen something that's grieved my heart recently about... <sighs> Uh, uh, the religious spirit wanting to mock Elijah prophets and what they carry, which is consecration. They carry consecration. They call the church into consecration. And there's a, there's a spirit of a religion that will come against that, just like with the Pharisees, and it will mock. And it will mock and it will say they are doom gloom prophets because we can't have balance, can we? I'm, no, I'm being sarcastic. Elijah was sarcastic, wasn't he? Oh, 
I don't mean to be sarcastic, but we need to have balance. We need to have balance in this hour and we can have to stop throwing the baby out with the bathwater and we need to have some maturity. And I really believe that God is bringing us into understanding the roles and functions of the different areas of the body of Christ because just because we don't understand something, just like the Pharisees, Jesus said they've already come and they weren't even seen. And I really believe that the the Elijah prophets are coming. They can't, there's some rising now. Um, we're, we're rising now, but but let me tell you that it's not in its full steam yet. And and there has and I want to warn God's people not to to uh, misunderstand or misinterpret what this spirit of Elijah is actually going to do. Now, I feel like I've got so much to say. I've seen recently some some um, some prophetic ministries uh, mock that spirit of Elijah and saying, "Oh, look, it's old news. We've had this consecration. We've had this talk of holiness. We've had this talk of oh, the church has always got to repent from lukewarmness. Oh, you know, ministers have always got to repent from being greedy with money. And oh, it's an old story. Wow, interesting. Um, that's that's interesting to me." Because, no, it's not an old story uh, because that is the spirit of Elijah. Now, and then they tag the spirit of Elijah as sin consciousness. The spirit of Elijah is not sin consciousness. It's actually a spirit of fire that will, if you if you look at those four landscape changes, it actually brings reconciliation. It brings, um, it does bring repentance, but repentance is not so much saying that you're an ugly worm and woe is me. Repentance is going, oh, okay, I'm in unbelief. I need to believe God and I don't need to fear and I don't need to play with the world and I don't need to be mixed with the world. You know, Jesus said to his disciples when they went out two by two and they couldn't, uh, they couldn't deliver this epileptic boy that had this spirit of epilepsy you see in the scriptures and Jesus called them a perverse generation and then he begins to talk about them the faith of a mustard seed and you think wow this is a really interesting line of thought you've got going on Jesus but what Jesus was saying is if we're mixed if we're mixed even the small amount of mustard seed of faith that we have can't work and so he was calling this generation a perverse generation that they couldn't cast out. He said, you little of little faith. They couldn't cast out this demon because they were mixed. And the spirit of Elijah is preparing a people that are going to govern in, uh, govern in um, you know, ruling and reigning with Christ. This is the lion that's coming, is a people that are going to be the sons of God, that are going to rule and, and rule with this with um, this governmental anointing. And But the thing is, when there's mixture, there's no faith. Your faith can't operate because you're mixed. And so calling people into repentance is not a doom, gloom, judgment position. Now, yes, some prophets have not been prepared properly and some prophets are bitter and some people have done it in a wrong spirit and there actually probably are false prophets that have tried to pretend they're in the spirit of Elijah and beat the church up. But we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and say that's old news and mock those that call the church to repentance Look, and, and call them to consecration. I want to share an intercession encounter with you that we had on Friday night which explains this whole thing. Now, one of our younger intercessors had a dream and in the dream, she, there was this fire truck and there were these firemen and she was there with a whole load of other people and this fire uh, firemen were standing lined up along this, it was like a, a dip, like you know how you dip cattle and you dip sheep, I don't know, in Australia we do that, you might do that in the States and elsewhere in the world. Well, we dip our animals to protect like from fleas and all of that. And there was this dip and my, and my, the younger uh, intercessor lady, she said, I didn't, in my dream, I didn't really want to walk into this dip, but there were these firemen that were standing along and she felt very intimidated. So she said, oh, do I have to go in? And they, they sort of shouted at her, yeah, you've got to go in. So she walked in and the dip was only knee deep, but she drowned in the dip. She nearly drowned. And she said, everyone that went into this dip drowned. She was the only one who got out. And when she got out, there were five blankets, wet blankets that were trying to to suffocate her and kill her off. And there was this sword she had in her hand that she was, um, 
that she, I know it sounds a bit odd. Dreams are odd, but she was uh, she pierced four of the four of the blankets, the wet blankets that she dealt with it. But the fifth one she couldn't deal with, and there was this candelabra, and she saw three candles, and the first two candles got snuffed out, and the third candle could light this last blanket that she didn't have the strength to deal with. Well, that same week, interestingly enough, I had a dream about a fire truck as well. And in the dream, I was trying to dismantle this fire truck and defuel it. And as I was defueling it, I was pulling these plugs on it, uh, this gas just started falling out at me and I started to get intimidated. Oh no, I've done the wrong thing. I better plug the fire truck back up again. And that was my dream. I'd been sitting on it, not understanding so much what it meant, but now I, I knew when we were in intercession what this meant. So what this meant was, that there is, the fire truck is trying to put out the fire, right? The, tr the fire truck is a religious spirit. And in this hour, the religious spirit is masking itself very differently to how it has in the past. Now, in the past, we think of a religious spirit as st stiff and starchy and rules and regulations, which, yeah, it still operates in that way. But I want to I wanna suggest to you another mask that a religious spirit has in this day, and it's called freedom. Because there are there is a religious spirit that doesn't want the church truly free, and so to be free you need to hear the truth. But what this what this spirit does it masks itself as freedom, and it will mock those that call the church to repentance and holiness and consecration, and it will say that's religious, that's religious, that's religion. In in itself, it is actually a religious spirit. And these firemen were the religious spirit, and they were forcing the church to come into this sheep dip, which is their version of consecration, which is actually going to kill them. And what these wet blankets was, it was trying to put the fire out, right? Now, a spirit of Elijah, as I said before, will bring people into the baptism of the Jordan in consecration of the heart, the circumcision of the heart that will ready them then for the baptism of fire. So can you see here, the Lord is wanting to send a fire in this earth to baptize his church afresh like never before, that they can be witnesses in the earth in these end days of the harvest, right? We, we need the fire. We need the fire. And I've got a whole sermon on the fire, but I can't. I don't have time for that now. You read Malachi 4. It talks about the day of the Lord that burns like an oven. It talks about the governmental church that's going to arise with fire. And they're going to uh, overthrow and walk upon the, the wicked and the evil and the pride and the arrogant. What's that? That's a spiritual battle. I'm not talking the flesh. It is dealing with rulers and principalities in, in, in heavenly places. And there will be ashes under our feet. That means we walk in fire. So there is an end time baptism of fire like that was a first uh, baptism of fire in the early church there's an end time baptism of fire now get this the five blankets of the false grace this false grace doctrine this this um oh you know what i mean the false grace doctrine because five means grace and it means favor but they're wet blankets because they're actually trying to steer the church away from true consecration and repentance so that they won't get the fire right? You can't get the fire unless you go through John the Baptist's uh, listening to the spirit of Elijah, the John the Baptist uh, river of repentance, right? That's why I was saying one time, you know, the, the spirit of the Lord come on me. And I was saying, you know, we call out for fire. We're calling out for fire, but don't call out for fire. You run to the river first. Don't you call out for fire because the fire will burn you up. You got to be, you got to be in a place of consecration, repentance. And when that fire comes on the church, man, they're going to be a force to be reckoned with and they will have the boldness, the ability to overcome every obstacle and get that harvest in. Now, that's in a bigger prophetic measure. Now, what this religious spirit will do is say, don't listen to the prophet, the Elijah prophets. They're, they're religious. They're Old Testament. They're troublers of Israel. They're, uh, don't listen to this message of consecration and repentance. It's a religious spirit. It's only going to bring you into bondage when actually it's a spirit that's going to bring you into true freedom. Because a, rebel, a spirit of religion is rebellion and, and rooted in pride, right? Now, when I was lift, pulling out this fire truck, which is to put out the fire, when I was pulling out, the, it was full of gas, which was pride. 
See, so it's it's words, it's the word of the Lord that comes with pride and arrogance and says you don't need to listen to any message about repentance. Now, I'm not talking sin consciousness. Just because we call stuff out doesn't mean that we ha- we're making everyone, you know, be on a witch hunt and call things and, and call it sin consciousness. But the deal is, I had a dream at the beginning of the year and there was a young girl playing on a fence and I heard in the dream, you need to get off the fence because the fire's coming. We can't stay in mixture. We can't stay borderline. We can't stay playing around with the world. We can't be on the fence. You know what on the fence means because the fire is coming. We need to position ourselves for the fire. Now, in this in this intercession encounter that that we had, the thir- we we were we were talking about what the three candles were. Now God's given me a word about this regarding. Uh, you know the the two the the third day church that's arising. Okay, uh, I'm writing a book on it at the moment. So God gave me a dream about you know there had been two days and we're entering the day of Ruach, the day of the Lord's power. And I went to Hosea chapter six, and there it talks about returning to the Lord. It talks about uh, there after two days I will revive you, and on the third day I'll raise you up. Now we are about to be revived after 2,000 years, a day of the Lord is a thousand years. After 2,000 years, the Lord is going to revive us, which we're, we're at that marker now. According to my dream, we're at that marker now. And on the third day, we're going to enter into governmental authority. We're overcomers, right? Ruling and reigning uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah who is overcome. So, so after 2,000 years, now these candelabras, there were three. And collectively, as we, as an intercession group discussed this, one of our intercessors said, the third candle's the third day. And instantly I knew what that represented. For 2,000 years, this spirit of religion has squashed and caused the church to sleep. So that's why the, that final blanket couldn't be put out by those first two candles. But the third candle could put it out because it's a church that is walking in the fire of God that is going to be able to quench this religious spirit and is actually going to be able to put out and to overcome these wet blankets that are trying to cause the fire to go out on the church and cause it to sleep all the time. Now, I want to bring something else out because this spirit of religion religion will cause you to sleep. You know, many times I see, I don't know, uh, in my own messages when I'm preaching in congregations and doing things uh, in, a, in, a, in a congregational me- uh, format, so not sort of much on live, I'll have people fall asleep while I'm preaching. And, they're pre- and when I'm preaching on... Now, I'm, I might be preaching up a storm. I might be preaching, but there'll be about th- different people... That, that will be falling asleep, that don't normally sleep through other sermons. And I've, I've gone to God about this because this happens a lot in my ministry. And I'm like, God, am I boring? Oh. But the Lord said to me, no, it's a spirit of religion and antichrist that is causing them to not have ears to hear. It's a spirit of slumber that comes on them. See, whenever there's a call to repentance, people don't want to hear it. They just want to go, la, 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 la. And I had a dream about that where the, the church has got their fingers in it, la, 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 la. They don't want to hear anything uncomfortable, anything that causes a challenge, anything that causes them to grow up. No, no, no. Just tell me that everything's going to be okay. Well, Jesus said trial and tribulation will come on the earth, but be of good cheer for I've overcome it. So Jesus, Jesus never fluffed our feathers. He never stroked our fur. He always called us to rise higher into an ability to overcome. See, that's what true sonship is. It's an ability to overcome. And the spirit of Elijah is preparing the sons of God right now to bring forth that governmental dominion, ruling and reigning position and demonstration and expression of Christ on this earth. And so the spirit of Elijah is needed. Because you cannot have mixture in ruling and reigning. Authority in, in government, you can't be submitted to two masters. Jesus even said it, Matthew 6, go read the whole chapter. You can't be submitted to two masters. And a spirit of religion will not want you to submit to the true authority of God because power and authority will come on you because you submitted under him. And true repentance will bring you back to submitting under his leadership because the sons of God are led by the spirit of God. See, so the spirit of Elijah is not to tell the church how bad she is. The spirit of Elijah is to call the church and tell her how great she is and not to follow after another, 
not to be deceived by the witchcrafts of Baal, not to be de deceived by the perversion of Jezebel, not to be deceived by the Antichrist doctrines and, and lukewarm uh, worldly lifestyles that are saying it's okay as a Christian to pacify and let's just be like everybody else. I say this in every message. I'm going to have to say it again. The answer to darkness is not more darkness. The answer to darkness is light. And the spirit of Elijah will call God's people back into a place of consecration where they've been asleep, even like the five wise and the five foolish virgins. The five wise were still asleep. It was a time of slumber. But then there's a time to wake up, to trim your wick, to get a fresh fire and go out and meet the bridegroom. And we're right there right now. We are ready to wake up. There's a call to wake up. There's a call to trim your wick, which is repentance, so that the fire of God can come. A fresh fire can come on his people and that they can truly go out and meet the bridegroom. Meet means there in the Greek, encounter him. So there is an encountering that the church are going to have with him afresh in this season that are going to propel them into destiny, propel them into victory. And, and, and don't you take and swallow that pill for a minute that the spirit of Elijah prophets are there to down beat down the church into a place of... Uh, sin consciousness. That's a lie from the pit of hell. It's a lie that tells you not to listen to a message of repentance, to keep in your lukewarm state, to stay in your sleeping slothful ways, your passivity, so that you won't be truly powerful to overcome that which comes your way. Jesus is bringing us back to faith. Faith is believing God wholeheartedly and not being mixed with fear, mixed with all the doctrines of this age, mixed with this is okay and that's okay, but actually coming back to the word of God. And that's what a spirit of Elijah does. Get ready, guys, because the spirit of Elijah is only, it's simmering under the surface. There is a, a company of prophets that are, gonna, are going to announce the day of the Lord and the day of the Lord is coming. They are announcing that kingdom day is coming. Get ready get ready, get ready. It is not a fear trip. It is a power trip. And you, and we've got to have ears to hear and eyes to see and not listen to this spirit of religion that wants to blank, wet blanket the church out and, and keep them under this, this um, false belief system that's caused us to be wimps. Sorry if I'm passionate. I am. Because I don't care what people say, I'm going to continue to love the church enough to call her into the heart of God. How can, how can anyone say that calling people into a greater place of consecration out of the world is a religious spirit? I don't get it. Read, read, the Revel read Revelation. Read all the, 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 the messages to the churches. They were all called to a greater place of consecration. All of them. The, especially the church of Smyrna was talking about a sleeping church. I think, no, Smyrna, was it Smyrna? Hmm. The, Revelation chapter three, I don't have it in front of me. If I've misquoted, apologi apologize, apolo apologies for that. But Revelation chapter three, I think it was the church in Smyrna. I might be wrong. I get them mixed up sometimes. But it talks about a sleeping church that slumber and it talks about actually they had their clothes soiled. What were they soiled with? The world. And Jesus is coming to pure. See, see the, the, the spirit of Elijah is the bright to make the bride ready. It says there in, in scripture, read it. Luke 1, 15 to 17, New Testament guys. They are to get a people made ready for the Lord without spot, without wrinkle. What are we spotted and wrinkled with? Come on, the world, fear. We're spotted with perversion. We're watching Hollywood as our as our Bible. Come on. We're, we're spotted with, with occultic belief systems. Yeah. We're spotted with witchcrafts. And, and we're just allowing all of this mixture in our homes. And we wonder why our children are rebellious and don't want to know anything about the Lord. And we drag them to church each week saying, you got to come to church. And they don't want to come. Why? Because we're allowing them to be fed on witchcraft, which is the root of rebellion. And we're saying, oh, no, that's OK. Don't, don't be religious and try and make me clean up my house. That's just a spirit of religion. I tell my kids it's not right. Get real. We got a clean house, and and look, the Bible says that a threshing, um, the the winnowing fork was in the Lord's hand, and He's coming to clean His threshing floor. You know, yeah, it is. This is the hour where the Lord is cleaning house. He is, and don't you don't you let anyone mislead you that that's not happening because it is. Because those that want to stay in their sin and stay. Uh, 
in their comfortable place because they're going to have to make some choices. They might have to lose some friends. They might have to change their job. They might have to do some radical stuff because we've found ourselves in such a place of compromise. So the spirit of Elijah calls the church out of a sleeping stupor of compromise into a place of being awake and on fire and in love with the Lord. Because let me tell you, James says you can't be a friend of the world and be in love with God. James says it, New Testament. James says that we have to purify our hearts and our soiled hands of our spiritual adultery. Are we reading the scriptures these days? How can anyone say that anyone that calls someone into consecration and carries a message of, of holiness and mocks it is a judgmental prophet? I'm sorry. Sit down. Be quiet. And stop deceiving the people of God from coming into a place of power and governmental authority. That's my rant for today. I just needed to, to say that. I had to wait till I was okay in my heart. I've been... You know, it's funny, I, I intercede stuff through, I grieve, I'm mourning, I'm, oh, I'm in a wrestle for days, weeks, sometimes, months, sometimes, until I come to a place I've broken through, peace, and I'm over it. And then all of a sudden, God says, oh, I want you to share that word. And you go, oh, okay, because <laughs> I'm through the other side. See, we've got to speak in a heart of purity and not frustration. We've got to speak in a heart of uh, mercy and truth and uh because, you know, it's the mercy of God. It's, the Bible actually says in Proverbs that by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged out of the heart of a man. So everything is balanced. God is balancing his uh, weights. And I just encourage you to have discernment in this hour and not to listen to every Joe Blow just because they got a name. You know, some people in sometimes just don't have discernment. And I, I, you cry out for discernment in this time because there are some wolves in sheep's clothing that are calling the church out of the River Jordan. And they're saying, don't go there. Don't go into the River Jordan. That's religion. Don't go there. That's sin consciousness. Don't go there. That only because in past times we've had an out of balance expression of the prophetic in, in, a, in a doom gloom way. So they throw everything out. We've got to come back to balance. We've got to come back to knowing the heart of God. And we cannot throw some scriptures out because it makes us feel uncomfortable. You know, I loved what Lance Walner said. I watched this post. I've post, reposted it on my page because he's just, I love it. He knows how to say stuff in truth. And he said, this generation, we're going to toughen up for goodness sake. What about the generation of the first early church and all the, all the persecution they had to deal with in Nero and all of those governments and empires and what, what they had to deal with? And we can't even handle some strong prophetic words because I'll oh, know it's going to put the people into fear. We need to understand that we are sons of daughters of God. And if, if God is for us, who can be against us? We are to govern. Any warning, any, anything is to be prayed over and to, and to be, uh, ass we have to assert our government on this earth. So don't you listen to people that are telling you that Elijah prophets and those in the spirit of Elijah are old hat, that they're troublers of Israel. Well, they are. They're troublers of mixture because Elijah come on the scene. Elijah's will come on the scene when God's people are in mixture. So let me let that just speak for itself. So Eli uh, uh, Israel was in mixture and Elijah come on the scene and Ahab called him a troubler of Israel and Elijah's throwback to that was, no, I'm not the one who troubled Israel. It's your leadership that's troubled Israel and brought them into a lukewarm state and caused them to sleep. And now they've got the judgment of all their harlotries upon them because they haven't known who to listen to. So God's dealing with the leadership in the house of God. Not, I don't care how many hate mail I get. It's true. God's showing me dream after dream. He's dealing with the, he's dealing with the leadership in the house at, the, at this time. He's causing there to be a measuring. I had a dream, uh, La, oh, when was it? 2017. It's in my book. That the house of God were, was full of snakes and that God was, was changing the guard. There's a shifting of the guard and there is a, a new breed arising and that there, were, uh, there was a, a measuring at the front of this house. And God's saying that, that I'm measuring my house in this hour. 
I'm measuring my house. I'm, I'm, I'm testing my house of where their faith is. Are they putting their faith in mammon? Are they putting their trust in mammon? Are they putting their reputation in mammon? Are they putting their identity in mammon? Where are my people placing their trust? And this is the spirit of Elijah will come and measure the church. It will come and bring the word of God back and it will expose through fire what who you're serving. And look, hey, what's the big deal? So, so what? Fears exposed. Okay, well, praise God. Let's get free of it. It's not to go, oh no, I've been such a wicked sinner and believing a lie. You just go, okay, I've believed that I believe this fear too long. It's time for it to go. It's crippling me. I repent of believing this fear. I repent of, you know, focusing on the world to be my savior. I repent of looking to the the hills as my salvation is what Jeremiah said. And I choose to come back to you, Lord, and believe you as my savior. We all need to do it. None of us are exempt from it. So, you know, like, let's get real. It's not sin consciousness. It's just God examines the heart. You read 1 Corinthians. He talks about God will test every man's work according to what they've been building on. Wood, hay or strubble, strubble, wood, hay or stubble or gold and silver. Come on, or precious stones. Have we been building a court to being led by the spirit of God and in faith and outside of our ability? Or have we been led in the comforts of the world system and the world's way? And then when the fire comes, that burns all that up and we're freaking out. The fire tests. Come on. I could go on and on, on and on and on and on. But I don't want to go on and on. I just... I want everyone to be, that hears this, to be informed that get ready. I just want to share one more dream. One more dream. While I'm raving, why not? Um, let's, let's continue just for a sec. I was just reading a comment, sorry. So I had this dream, and I've shared this in one of my other videos, but I know you don't all get to see my videos and all that, so whatever. So in, in this dream... Uh, there was, I was invited to go, uh, to a meeting, uh, in our city cause our city's, um, it represents, you know, our city's quite a party city, you know? Uh, so there's a lot of perversion. There's a lot of ungodliness. There's a lot of underground crime, drug running, lots of stuff like that. Even though on the surface, it looks like a gold, you know, uh, a great holiday destination. There has been in past times, great, um, you know, darkness. And still continues to be. But praise the Lord, that's changing. There is, God is moving. But so anyway, in my dream, uh, I was invited to speak at these people that were hungry for the Lord. They were hungry for the spirit of God. So they were like, you know, they were they were consecrated ones. They weren't sort of like lukewarm, uh, superficial Christians. They were some people that were hungry. But when I got to this meeting, they were all dressed very inappropriately, barely with nothing on. Because that's the culture in our city, right? And uh, I'm thinking, what's going on here? And next door was this dark nightclub that was actually a lot of perversion and really dark sin was going on in this nightclub right next door to where we were holding this meeting. And after that, I said, look, I'm not comfortable with this. I don't think, you know, you guys need to know this isn't okay, what you're doing. You're too close to evil. You're too close to darkness. You're, you're playing around with mixture. Anyway, one of the men uh, in the group, he got so angry and offended at me and was almost like, how dare you say that to me? Uh, and it was funny in the dream, I had this boldness come on me and I pointed my finger at him. And when I point in dreams, it's always the prophetic word of the Lord. And I said, you need to listen and understand something. I said, whatever it is in your heart that is offended right now at the word of the Lord, you need to deal with it because God in this hour is bringing the word of the Lord straight to his people. And it may be coming in a way you're not used to, but it, but it's almost like God's tried the other ways. And in this way, he's bringing the hammer. He's bringing the hammer because there's an urgency. And, and I said, you know, um, I said, because this house, um, no, not house, because this city is a Sodom and Gomorrah. And I woke up and the Lord showed me that when Jesus sent out the disciples, he said to them, those who don't receive the word of the Lord from you, don't shake it, shake the dust off your feet and take your peace with you. And then he said, for, for uh, woe to this generation or those who don't receive, for greater the judgment will be upon them as of Sodom and Gomorrah. So the Lord is saying that those, um, that look, I know this sounds like a heavy word. Maybe it is. Um, I just see things plainly, you know. The Lord is saying that this hour, God is bringing the word of the Lord straight. He's not mucking around. There's no like read between the lines. It is what it is because he loves his people enough to bring them higher. And so 
uh, you know, there, there was this response of offense, like how dare you deliver the word that way. And that's why I'm saying, get ready for the delivery to come. Not harsh. I'm not saying harsh. I'm not giving a license for people to come in and bash people up verbally. That's, or spiritual abuse. I'm not saying that. Let's be balanced. I'm not saying that. But I am saying you may not be used to the word of the Lord that's going to come the way it is because it's going to come with fire. The word of the Lord is going to come with fire in this hour. It's going to come direct. It's going to come strong and it's going to come to purge the hearts of men because God doesn't want the, the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah to be upon his people. So he's saying we need to have ears to hear and eyes to see in this time. So there you go. I just thought I'd share that word with you. Uh, I think I've shared pretty much everything that I was going to share. So I pray that you were blessed. I pray that it meant something to you. I pray that you're encouraged. I pray that you were actually sort of some clarity had come because uh, there's a lot of voices out there and there's a lot of known voices out there that uh, are, you know, are saying not to, to, to sort of, you know, listen to the message of consecration or holiness. And I, I really... Uh, feel that I need to warn his people not to go into the sheep dip of religion and let the firemen put your fire out, but go into the baptism of repentance and let the Holy Ghost baptize you with fire. So praise the Lord. Love you guys. Thanks for listening. Share this with your friends who need to be set free from that voice of religion that tries to condemn and mask itself as a spirit of freedom and mocks those that are in consecration and holiness. Uh, so be blessed. Love you all. And I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.